It's so good to see you, Laura. It's been too long. First, I want to ask how you are. I'm good. I'm really good. It has been a long time since I've seen you, isn't it? Like, yeah. gee, the last time I saw you in person, I can't even remember. Um, but things are going all right. Things have been challenging, I think, for everyone. Work has been, weirdly, probably the biggest chapter in my life. And at the same time, the most locked down chapter of my life. So mm. it's been a really strange coexistence at the moment. Um, it's kind of like you take a new job and the job I'm talking about is the one in radio breakfast show uh, for a sports radio station. And there's no sport um, <laughs> is is probably the most challenging thing. Yeah, like I say, that I've ever had to do. Um, but at the same time, it's been like a, a period of growth. Um, I've learned a lot. And I wouldn't say, you know how some people say I wouldn't have it any other way. That's mm. not I would have it a million other ways other than this, but it's what we are living in. So yeah, we've just been cracking on. So all in all, I've been all right. And you're doing brilliantly as well on TalkSport. I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> you alluded it to, uh, to it there when we worked together. Uh, yeah. We worked together, what, how many years ago now? Three years, do you, would you say? I think this is the third season, I want to say. Yeah, third uh, season. Yeah. I was making a joke with my yeah. brother last night about how your career has absolutely rocketed since you've stopped working with me so it's like a direct correlation <laughs> no not at all you know what i i loved those days because those days were just like they were great weren't they i mean we mm. worked hard we worked long hours um we worked hard we traveled around i always remember that time <laughs> i always remember we used to work with shane and we were getting the train somewhere and we didn't know if we had a hotel booked yeah and we and then we were like Shh. i don't know if i can swear on this but then yeah we were like, go for oh, it what? shit we don't have a hotel booked it was in manchester wasn't it and it was the manchester derby the next day i want to say mm, yeah it was all, all the hotel rooms were taken we were we were, all of us were on phones to different um hotels i think we got into one and then our producer was like i've booked one as well so then we had two hotel rooms each mm. then we had to cancel one of them one of them was super expensive but you couldn't cancel that it was just like a nightmare wasn't it yeah i was actually watching that video the, the other day it's absolutely <laughs> crazy that like, that time of our life existed I remember there was a clip where Matt Connell was editing a video at 1am. <laughs> you kind of think, what were we doing? I, I remember being in, in the studios, our little studio, which basically was like the stairwell, wasn't it? Mm. For you, what, that YouTube yeah. series that we did. <laughs> we, were wait, we were like in there until like the early hours of the morning trying to get stuff done and cut things. And I remember we were all having a go at cutting stuff, weren't we? It was just, mm. it was such a funny time. Yeah. I look back on it, it was such fun memories I loved I loved doing all of that stuff soccer am online and I look at the YouTube channels now and I think oh my god like look at the subscribers and the views mm. and I remember when we put our first video out it was something like 5,000 views wasn't it and we yeah. were like buzzing yeah exactly <laughs> 5,000 views and look at the comments we really were just learning were we on the job none of us yeah. had a clue what we were doing just blagging it <laughs> we were just absolutely blagging it I remember we used to script it so hard as well the beginning mm. and I notoriously was just flipping dreadful at remembering my lines and just hated it and then that lasted for maybe like a few months and then we we turned into let's just wing it <laughs> and yeah. actually it was much better wasn't it yeah it was I remember oh. the first time we filmed you what and uh <laughs> we, we filmed the entire thing sat down and then Shane said how about we uh, film it all standing up now and Sorry, it took like about two hours I, don't, I remember that it was needs a bit more energy. And we were just like, okay. <laughs> we wanted it out the next night as well. So we were like, brilliant. That I remember crazy. leaving Sky at 6 a.m. that next morning. Are you serious? Yeah, because I saw oh, yeah. people coming in um, the next day to work and they were like, wow, you're in early. Probably oh. thinking you look like shit. Oh, we were, like bags underneath my eyes. Yeah. The, best, the best thing I will ever remember about that job was pitching to Sky that we really should go to the Euros. And mm. uh, even though Sky weren't covering it, we don't get those rights. Um, it's an ITV, it's a BBC thing. Yeah, but we should really go. Because, yeah. And I always remember putting that pitch together and and the one the best line in that pitch was giving the fans a window into the Euros if you're not there. And I swear to God that sold it. And then we were like, right, let's get a sponsor on board. Let's get some money. And we were all buzzing about like getting these nice cars to drive around yeah, yeah. France with. And we got, <laughs> what was that? What was it? It was, like it was a, a Vauxhall van. That was it. It was a Vauxhall van. No offense, Vauxhall. It, we, it was great that you gave us those and we loved them. But the back seats didn't have windows. <laughs> 
so everyone was doing journeys and like at one point it wasn't one of the journeys like six or seven hours and whoever yeah. was sitting in the back was just in darkness then <laughs> we had we had one person owen who couldn't drive yes. so he was just getting chauffeured around the entire country sleeping in the back seat in the back I was right some. trains i'm pretty sure like yeah. it was Take my hair. Oh my god, it was chaos, wasn't it? But I loved it. It was like all the fan parks. I remember going and buying like tickets off a ticket tout to get mm. into Iceland, Portugal. Yes, yeah, I remember and that as well. And we were up the in the gods. In the gods, weren't they? Yeah. But then I made friends with a with a group of chefs. Do you remember they were dressed? They were dressed as chefs. Yeah, rings a bell. It, it was because it was offensive to Portuguese or something like that. But I wasn't sure why. We met them in the pub. They had a spare ticket and they were like, why don't you come with us? And they didn't speak English <laughs> and I didn't speak Portuguese. So we were just sitting there like, <laughs> so funny. I it was like, all like duh, 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 yeah, duh. yeah, yeah. I absolutely loved it. And when we oh, played hide and seek in that Airbnb. Yeah. It was that the one, <laughs> oh, which one was that? It was Bordeaux, was it or something? Bordeaux. Was it... it was Bordeaux. You're yeah. absolutely right. It was a beautiful little town, wasn't it? Mm amazing big airbnb with like 100 rooms that's the exaggeration yeah. and us adults were playing hide and seek it was a castle into- really wasn't it it was no you know what we didn't uh, play hide and seek in the castle oh yeah different place hide and seek in the family home because i remember somebody got in between the mattress and the bed stand yes and we couldn't the, the, we couldn't find who was that that wasn't you was it no i i hit um there was a there was a little ledge underneath the stairwell and I remember hiding it thinking, no one's going to find me. I'll be here for two days. Just leaning over the edge of it, walk, watching people walk up and down the stairs like, where is he? <laughs> and I'm just there like, watching you all. <laughs> Who went in the cupboard? Who went in the cupboard? He might have been Owen. And he was like in the cupboard in the kid's room. And he sat in the cupboard on top of something. And then he just heard cracks and it went. Yeah. And he realised he was on an Airfix model and he flattened it. <laughs> this was someone's house. We it were was just someone's there, like, home. And do you remember the deposit? I don't think we got the yeah. deposit back. Kate, no. Kate Walker had to sort it out. We were like, see ya. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those are the days. That was a good bit of travel. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. So I was going to touch on the fact that you are one of the hardest working people I know. So you work oh. for Sky Sports, Talk Sport, Breakfast Show, of course. You do the Super 6 podcast. How yeah. on earth do you find time for it all? Um, I, do you know what? I'm, I, so I'm winging it. I'm sort of winging it day by day. Um, I'm trying my best to find a little bit of balance because it's, to be honest, it's probably a bit too much. Mm. Um, But the thing is, I've I've had this work ethos always. So I kind of, I see it as I'll never be good enough at my job, in my own opinion. I'll always want to be better at it. Um, And I'll set my, I'll set those standards myself. You know, I, I don't, I don't look around too much because I know what I need to do that's better. So I try not to kind of compare too much to other people because I don't I don't know if that's a healthy way of, of looking at things. Mm. You don't want to look at someone else and go, I want to be like that. You want to look in the mirror and go, I want to be a better version of you. I want to be the best version I can be. And I want to be a, as good at my job as I can be. I don't think it ever works modeling yourself on anybody else. And mm. I've learned that over time. So my kind of... Um, my drive at work has always been the more work I have, the more experience I'll get. So mm. it's almost like if you're learning to drive a car, you're clocking up the hours, aren't you? So the longer you're in that car and driving around, the quicker you'll master it. Mm. So I've always had that in my mind about any job I've done at Sky from the very beginning, if that be running, assistant producing, producing, reporting or presenting all the mm. way up the ladder. And I, I still have that in my head. So it's yeah. only really this season that I've gone, you should slow down a little bit because these are now, this isn't necessarily a learning, they will always be learning exercises, but you kind of have to also value the time off because otherwise yeah. when you're working at a job where my alarm goes off at 10 to four, wow. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday morning, you have to rest and you have to eat right, drink lots of water and exercise. And if you're not getting all of those things done, then you will fall off a cliff pretty quickly. And, you know, as well, like, you know, just as well as I do in football, it is, this, it's, a, it's a living thing, you know, it's, it's evolving every day. And if you miss a little bit of news, mm. you're out of date. And my life for the last five years, especially, has been solely focused on football. So whereas back in the day, 
I was like all over darts and I because that was my job and I used to flip from sport to sport at Sky before we started specializing in football and I have such a hunger for it that I don't want to miss a thing you know I want I want to always be on the ball haha <laughs> I want to always know what's going on so so it's I find it hard to switch off but I the great thing about it is I don't really want to so even when I'm like chilling out you know but I I thought about this the other day I was like on my social media feed even though I'm just flicking through social media I'm actually working because yes. every everyone I follow is all about football and actually that's what I'm into so it's kind of two birds with one stone so yeah really I mean this season I'm trying to find that balance so I'm trying to say no to things and almost turn that switch off where where everything's like yeah I'll do it I'll do it I'll do it I'll do it and I'll learn from it all so you mentioned there about how you started uh, working for Sky as a runner that's not something I did so I was wondering if you could give both myself and the listeners a bit of an insight into what that's like am I allowed to call you Billy Big Bollocks for coming straight in and yeah yeah I remember when you (laughs) came in Smithy does we were like, we were like, hang on a minute. I'm sorry, you haven't come in through the bottom up. Yeah. Because yours was an internship, and then they were like, get him in. He's like the brain. Uh, yeah. Not yeah. not exactly, but yeah. <laughs> sort of along those lines. Yeah, I remember yeah. that so clearly. Because you were, how old were you when you got that job? I started working at Sky when I was 18, and then started working for this soccer AM digital stuff when I was 19. So yeah. Did I meet you when you were 19? Yeah. <laughs> how old are you now? 25. <laughs> <laughs> when did you turn 25? I know, I know. I, that's, I can, do you know what? That gives me so many different emotions. So many emotions that I knew you when you were 19. Mm. But also so many emotions that it's like, that's gone so quickly. And mm. you're like 25. That's just madness. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> it really is. Oh my God. So I started at Sky when I was 21 and I was a runner. So I'd just come back from traveling. Um, I'd done a little bit of work experience and I was like obsessed. I knew I knew as soon as I walked in the door, literally like I, I went to the coffee machine to make coffees and I was just like, this is the best coffee machine I've ever seen. <laughs> you know, you know? Yeah. everything. I was like, these cups are amazing. Everything mm-hmm. about Sky was was like incredible to me so I knew I didn't like experience and like newspapers and other places and I was like this isn't this isn't my life this isn't how I want to work I'm not obsessed with it and I have that character if I I have to be obsessed with something to be interested it's either it's one end of the spectrum not interested obsessed and that's always where I am over here so um I walked in and I was like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. I, I want to work here. I have to work here. Then I went off traveling. Then I was emailing constantly while I was traveling. I was like, I've got to get back in. No reply. And I was devastated. Mm. So I was just like, how much is too much? Do you know what I mean? How many emails? Yeah. Too many emails. And uh, I didn't want to upset anyone. But at the same time, I was like, I have to get in. Mm. When I came back, no reply to the email. So I got the number of the switchboard. And uh, the woman was like, do you work at Sky? And I went, no, but I want to. And she cut me off. And I was like, oh, hang on a minute. And now I know that's just security protocol. If you say you don't work at Sky, they think that you're like telecommunications or something like that. And they, they will cut their blood. Well, if you no, sorry, unless mm. you want to get through to someone directly and you have a sort of appointment, you won't get through. So anyway, this really, this was like a dagger to my heart for about two weeks. And it really knocked me because I was like, oh, my, my, my life at Sky, as I've imagined it for the last six months while I'm traveling, is not going to happen um and I wouldn't I refused to let that happen I was like I'll find another way in so I emailed and emailed and then eventually I got another one I got an email back from this woman um and she was like I'm really sorry I don't work in this department anymore it's this person so then I started bugging her and then eventually um I called her as well this time I got through and I was like I just want to make teas I was like just let me in Mm. let me come in for a week they put me on um what we call the pub sports team and the rest is history I got a a job as a runner off the back of it I was there for two weeks work experience they liked me I guess I asked the right questions and made the the right impression Mm. on people I made as many friends as I could I went and met everyone and introduced them and made sure I got to know them knew all their names um and I think it got me in and then I worked my way up I learned how to produce um I learned how to edit not very well but enough to get me by I learned how to direct on shoots, but I wanted to interview. So I was always trying to do the interviews behind mm. the scenes. And then gradually I, I jumped from one team to the next with the mind of moving into reporting. And little by little, they gave me opportunities. But really it was, 
I started doing like a YouTube series on my own um, with darts players, interviewing darts players, and I cut it, put it out on the YouTube channel for Sky. And um, I think that really got me a lot of confidence. And then eventually, mm. through other little roles, um, I got an audition for Soccer AM online. And it was a dreadful audition, I have to be honest. <laughs> I remember it was, it was it. the ball in the cup, wasn't it? Oh, it was the YouTube oh, ball in the cup one. thing. That was no? my application. Okay. Dog pong. Oh dog my god. Pong. It's dog pong. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Somebody, I re- I always remember somebody commented on that video saying, "Yeah, it's really funny, but um, that's actually really cruel for the dog." And I was like, "Delete, block, get uh, out." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's my sis- that's my sister in law's dog, and she was fine. Her name's Maggie, and she's still alive to this day. Lovely so, dog as well. Um, yeah, she's a lovely dog. I remember that I was like, I was looking at other YouTube people and what the sort of stuff they do. And I was like, I don't want to do any of that. And then Mm. I have no idea where it came from. Honestly, genuinely, it just came out of nowhere, that that idea. And I was like, sod it, it's going to be completely left to field, but it worked. And I always remember them saying that um, it stood out, that application video stood out for whatever reason, (laughs) it just did. (laughs) Just completely Um, different from the rest. Yeah, and then I got my audition, and I always remember Shane. Hi, Shane. Shane did the audition right, and uh, it was so weird because it was like he he was like pretend you're interviewing someone. It's just been the North London derby. I think he said I think Spurs had beaten Arsenal, and he was like nobody knows that you're an Arsenal fan. You've got to go and interview um, Spurs fans and and be neutral. And I was like mm. oh, okay, and um, but I always remember the camera looking at me here. And he was like, pretend that you're interviewing um, the camera. I was like, what? <laughs> so I was like, so like, tell me how you feel. And said like all this sort of crap to the camera. And it was so awkward. And I was like, Shane, why? But I just went with it because I was like, this is yeah, audition, of course. So I can't, you know, I can't do anything about that. I, I remember Scotty was in the audition as well. I had to interview yeah. Alex Scott. And then both of us got jobs. And then, um, yeah, we cracked on and we, and we started. We were the, the the presenters along with Adam Smith, Smithy. We were the presenters of uh, Soccer M's new YouTube channel. And look how well you are all doing now. Absolutely. <laughs> Funny, Everything isn't it? Away. What Crazy. a breeding ground. That audition yeah. process. They know who to pick, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God, those days. I miss it. <laughs> yeah, me too. You spoke about your mentality to say yes to work because I was going to touch on that. So you, you did bowling, I remember, darts, NFL. Uh, game changes was that was that your aim just to say yes and pick up as much experience as you could yeah yeah I always remember because it was like I couldn't get a break on anything it wasn't easy for me um some people are in the right place at the right time I was I suppose for the work experience element of that but everything else was hard as guy everything else I found difficult um I always remember the attitude towards young women that want to be presenters the general attitude around sky was oh yeah, you want to be a presenter, so does everyone else. And Mm. I always always remember being like, someone's got to do it, haven't they? Mm. And and I actually, yeah, I do want to do it. And I've been to uni, I've done journalism. Um, I'm doing everything else I can to to find my voice in this place. So why not? Why not me? And I always remember one of my colleagues suggested to me not to tell anyone I want to be a presenter because it means that I wouldn't take the job seriously that I was doing then and there. And I was like, well, that's bollocks. It kept me quiet for about a week. And I, I remember thinking that I'm not, I don't want to take that advice. I'm not going to take that advice. So what it meant was when I did get any opportunity, it felt like gold dust. I was like, oh my God. Like, and I took it all as seriously as, you know, I remember doing 10 pin bowling um, and it was like the Champions League final. Yeah. You know, for me, it was like, oh my God. I was only reporting, wasn't presenting. I would research it for days. I'd make sure I knew everything about it. I did snooker. Yep. Pool the Moscone Cup. Yes, of course, cup. yeah. <laughs> um, that was amazing. I did, obviously, darts, which I was just in love with, obsessed with. Did a little bit of tennis. I just, I honestly picked up anything and everything. NFL, loved mm. it. Carved myself this sort of fancy NFL show as well, fancy football. Um, and I just, I just felt like it was, that's how I knew I wanted to do it because I got a buzz from it, a massive buzz that I didn't get from anything else. So producing mm. didn't give me that buzz. And I, was, I just never really felt like it was, it would have been enough for me. I was always like, well, what's next? What's next? And then I realized the reason I was thinking that is because it wasn't what I wanted to do. So anything I could do reporting or presenting or in front of the camera gave me this like real thrill, this real excitement. Um, and also I was so bad when I started, I was so bad. 
on it, I, I, well, I can't watch stuff back because I'm like, oh. <laughs> and I knew it at the time as well because you can tell when it's not your voice, can't you? Yeah. Something- that you're like who's that like yeah right? I'm, I'm even finding that now i'm talking to you and i'm like i, I wouldn't talk like this if i was talking yeah to you. why am i being so eloquent like it's, <laughs> it's really yeah. strange isn't it i always remember gary neville saying that the first time we did like monday night no it was the first time we did commentary actually cocoms and the way he was speaking he always credits this producer that used to work at sky called scott melvin yeah scott melvin was like why are you talking like that and he went well i'm you know i'm being professional and i'm commentating and da, 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 da. like you know being really um, decisive with all the letters and all the words and stuff mm. like that, I'm sounding quite posh. He went, yeah, that's that's how, not how you speak. That's not what you would say in a normal conversation. Just use your own language, your own voice, and just be natural and normal. And as soon as he started doing that, he just, you know, mm. he just became like a cut above the rest. And I think the best that we've got. Yeah, um, yeah. And I always remember seeing that and hearing about that. And my thing is finding your own voice. So when we went to France and covered the Euros, we had a contract with Facebook, didn't we? We had to do a 10 Mm. minute live Facebook every day. And some days there was loads to talk about when we were in the group stages and there were games, you know, loads of games happening all the time. Then as it got to the knockout stages, we'd have like a period of days where there was no football. So, but Mm. we still had to do this content. And I remember being in a car park, you know, between Paris and and Bordeaux, for example, driving from one place to the next with nothing to talk about, no scenery, Mm. having to commit to this contract and having to do a a 10 minute Facebook Live. And you didn't have time to prepare. So it wasn't like, and there was no point preparing because there's nothing really to say. We would just go, should we just do it here? And we'd be like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. And, And that was genuinely my breakthrough of where I, my natural voice came out. I suddenly found a style of presenting, which, I felt relaxed with um and that was when my natural voice came out so I'll always credit that time because you don't have time to think about it I remember we were just sitting in the garden one morning we were all quite hungover actually we did a a Messi Ronaldo debate it was the Euros Messi wasn't even in it do you know what I mean we were like we'll talk about Ronaldo because I don't think he was having a very good tournament was he because I swear to god Portugal hadn't scored yeah, in, they, I think they drew every minutes. game or something. Yeah. yeah, and it was and it was always like group stage. I think they had draws and then like force it to extra time. It was one penalties? I swear one went to penalties yeah. as well. I don't think they won a game in regular time until the final. That, that was it, wasn't it? Yeah, was some, that might be wrong, but it was almost like they'd sort of dragged themselves to the final, being really boring, and we were mm. like, "Oh, this is crap, whatever." Um, and then anyway, we, we we were reading comments, weren't we? Facebook live comments. That was the first time we were sort of integrating with people mm. like that. So you couldn't really filter them. Everyone could see them. And someone had mentioned something about Messi and it just became a messi Ronaldo debate. And we just got so many views, didn't we? And mm. we were like, wow, this has gone mad. And I remember thinking 90,000 at the time was a lot. Yeah. I think it got 90,000 views or something. And we were like, we're tapping into something here. Well, it's discussion, it's conversation. Um, and at the time I, I forgot, I forgot about trying to present and I just presented mm. and that's what you have to do. You have to forget again, going back to the car analogy, when you learn to drive, first of all, you go right, uh, clutch, gear, gas, um, brakes, handbrake, and do you know what I mean? Like to, There's so many then, components. Yeah. And then when you learn to drive, you forget that process and you do it naturally. And that's what presenting is as well. Mm. Amazing. So do you set targets for yourself? Because obviously, I'd say in the last couple of years, you've really taken off. Your career's really hit new heights. Or do you just tend to work as hard as you can and see where that takes you? Yeah, I do that. I keep seeing everywhere that we should set targets and we should do five-year plans and one-year plans and all this Mm. sort of stuff. Um, I couldn't really tell you. um, There's not that many roles in presenting, not in sports presenting anyway, and not in football. So... You know, if someone said to me, set set yourself a five-year plan, I'd go, well, okay, um, I want to present Super Sunday, for example. Mm. Well, there's a presenter on Super Sunday, so you can work as hard as you can, but that mm. presenter is really good, and he's not going anywhere. So you might get to the end of that five years, and he's still in his prime, and he's still as good, if not probably better, but that doesn't mean that you failed you are a better presenter too in five year time. It's just, you haven't got that one job. So I find five year plans really difficult. Um, also, if I started working at TalkSport because I had a show taken away from me at Sky. So 
we used to do that Carling and the Bar show. It was a pub show mm. and it was live and it was amazing. And it was the first live TV I'd ever done. And I loved it. And we were called into the boss's office, me and Smithy, and we were told that we wouldn't be doing it anymore. And the job was going to Max Rushton. And it really rocked us and it knocked our confidence. And we were like, wow, is, you know, is there anything else that we can do? And there, there wasn't anything else we could do. So at the time I remember going home and, and being upset about it, but um, I don't, I don't cry about stuff. I, um, I get angry. And when I get angry, it makes me kind of go, well, what else can I do? So then I remember being like, okay, there's no options immediately at Sky. So that's TV scratched off. I was already doing bits and bobs outside of TV that uh, outside of Sky on TV, like um, pre-recorded things for golf. That's another thing I've done. I've done golf. <laughs> <laughs> done everything. Um, for, you know, outside channels that basically you do it for them and then they sell it back to Sky. So technically it's still on Sky. Mm-hmm. And I, I, oh, I've always listened to radio and always loved radio. And I remember thinking radio would be a great breeding ground to, to, Im- to basically improve. So I said to Sky, can I go and audition with TalkSport? And there was openings and stuff. And they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's fine, go and do it. Do, do whatever you want. So then um, I started auditioning and I got the job reviewing the breakfast uh, papers on the breakfast show with Alan Brazil, which was like a dream job to work alongside him because he's just incredible. And he's been my hero for as long as I can remember listening to TalkSport, which might just be at the beginning when my dad started listening. So 20 odd years ago my dad's hero as well everybody in my family listens to it so it was a, it was a real moment and I got that role literally half an hour reviewing the papers in and out early in the morning from 7 till 7 30 one day a week it was amazing and then that became two days a week then it became more sections then it became four days a week and then that role really started to snowball so I remember people going I remember walking into sky and people going oh I listened to you this morning on TalkSport," and I was like wow, that's, like, that's amazing. Thanks very much. Then they gave me a co-host job on Friday nights at TalkSport. And then in my second season, they gave me the 5.30 kickoff live on my own. We would travel to a ground every week. It was like mad busy, but it was amazing. And um, I was hosting live football and I just couldn't believe, I couldn't believe what was happening. Um, at the same time, Sky then were giving me more opportunities to um, report so going and interviewing Premier League players they would that was going out on Super Sunday every week that then developed into a pitch side role as well so I almost felt like one summer which was two summers ago now it, it just it just exploded and everything happened at the same time and I went from really scrapping hard for things to having these most incredible roles in front of me that I did not feel good enough to handle and so I had to learn on the job really quick. Um, so then I don't remember ever feeling good enough to pick those out to say, I want that role. I was like, well, I'll never get that role. So I won't even, mm. I won't even try. Do you know what I mean? And then yeah. it, it just, it just ended up that way. And then obviously talk sport then developed into the breakfast show, which I was just like, just knocked my head off really. <laughs> yeah. It still does. <laughs> I think that's the best way to be, to be honest. Just work really hard, be really good at what you do, and eventually yeah. the results will come. Yeah. And you can, you know, you can now knock. I've I've made a career of knocking on doors. Mm. It's just that I just didn't know which ones I was necessarily going to end up knocking on. If that makes sense. Like when I was younger, I'd knock on every door possible. Now, obviously, that I have these incredible roles, um, my focus is to be as good at them as I physically can so it doesn't really end if I'm honest like for yeah. me it doesn't end I think it's I think it's relentless and I think that's kind of in a way I think I, that's how I like it yeah so I want to talk about your Twitter account because like I say I remember when you had how, how many followers like a couple of thousand do you remember when I got the blue tick and I had yeah. like we were making a joke of is it is it a world record for a blue tick with the least amount of followers yeah and we were just finding these local reporters from like the Dublin Express who've got less than you and be like, hey, Laura, found some bloke called Niall. He's got 21 followers, but he's got pretty thick. <laughs> it was so good, wasn't it? Oh my God. It was so funny. And Smithy had loads. Yeah. And I always remember him hammering me because he had like 100,000 and I had like yeah. 2,000 or something. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Well, now you've got 400,000 followers. <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? It's what crazy. happened there? Well, I reckon I reckon it's because your tone is so good. I think you do Twitter better than most people because you speak to people as if they're your mates. 
And I think yeah. you do that really, really well. Is, do you have a strategy? I know you wouldn't necessarily think of it that deep, but do you have a way in which you try and grow your Twitch account or is it just completely organic? Do you know what I don't like doing? Uh, um, if that's a strategy, I, I don't like flooding. So I'm actually, a, I'm actually quite selective at, about what I tweet. So what I actually tweet out. Now that when you reply to people, it just goes on like a separate page. I feel better about that. But um, I try not to flood because I get annoyed with people. And I'm not always on Twitter anymore as well. I have to kind of take the rough of this move with Twitter a little bit. So I remember I remember always wanting it to be authentic. Um, and that was when I started getting more followers. I, I was like... I didn't really know what the voice should be, what the tone should be at the beginning. And again, in the same way that I sort of found presenting, um, I think working on Soccer AM Online as well and kind of engaging with people, I really enjoyed that. And, you know, we used to go outside stadiums, didn't we, in the freezing cold and, mm. and spend our evenings talking to fans and taking the, the mick out of fans, you know. And um, that was always, that was how I liked doing it and that felt authentic to me. So then I kind of, it just became my voice on Twitter. And then um, I did notice the more prominent I got or the more known I became in the world of, of football and Twitter and social media and stuff like that. With more followers comes more scrutiny and with more scrutiny comes more abuse. Mm. And um, my way of handling that at the time was kind of, um, sometimes I'd react uh, angrily and I realized that doesn't work. And then, mm. um, Sometimes I'd spin it and make a joke out of it. And um, and that became a thing for a while, you know, it just became like just sort of muggy replies became something yeah. that I just enjoyed doing. Yeah. Um, when it becomes more and more and more following, you feel a bit more of a responsibility not to be like that. Mm. <laughs> so now I'm a little, I've toned it down a little bit, but yeah, I'll always try and, and, and be authentic on it because it's kind of, I think it's quite transparent when you're not. Yeah. And obviously like stuff happens, you know, when you get more followers, you have people that are like, do you want to work with us? And do you want to do this? And a lot of the time I'm like, no, I don't, mm. I don't really want to. Cause I cringe when I see other people doing it. But then other times I'm like, it's part of my job. So, you yeah. know, if, it, if it's an, if it's something that I do believe in, I won't do it if I don't really believe in it. You know, if it's a product that I think uh, I, I wouldn't yeah. use it, I would, I would say no to it. There was one recently Carling, funnily enough, who we'd worked yeah. with before their campaign was about supporting your local. And I feel quite strongly about that. So I was like, this is something genuine that I would like to get on board with. So um, yeah, I did that. Yeah, nice. You mentioned it there about the Twitter replies, because I remember the days where you would reply to absolutely everyone. And we'd be like- we were encouraged to, weren't we? we were yeah. Like, you know, speak to people. And I was like, great, I love it. And mm. I literally did, didn't I? Every yeah because I got five tweets a week <laughs> well, mate, <laughs> so yeah. like, here's a paragraph in reply and how's your mother <laughs> yeah maybe you're a bit more grateful back then I suppose you can't do that anymore you, you must no. have to ignore some people yeah and I still find it rude genuinely what I find with um the platform that I have now I'm really lucky actually with especially with TalkSport is they'll let me talk about anything which um I'm not sure if they know that's the dangers of that yet <laughs> but they will they will they will literally be like, if you want to discuss something, you can. And I obviously will always do it responsibly, but we have had um, big conversations then uh, before um, in the time I took over about COVID, about Black Lives Matter, about mental health, um, racism, homophobia. You know, we've, we've literally, we've covered so much on that show. And I understand what happens with those clips. They get clipped up and they get put out on social media and they generate debate especially when you are discussing something as sensitive as black lives matter for example or a, a mental health issue or suicide or something like that um it can get really deep and people can really people react heavily to that kind of thing so those replies can can be you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of replies and you're never going to get through them all um and i still at the back of my mind when people say you know especially mental health this is how I'm feeling and I found here's my example of something mm. I would love to get to the I would love to get through all those replies so I can reply to those people but what happens is as you filter through those replies you see some really nasty ones and mm. and they're the ones that kind of go and they like stick in your chest and you think oh and actually you don't have the capacity to deal with that so that's why I have to kind of go 
here's what we talked about. It's out there. And I shut the door and sometimes I mm. delete the app and I ignore it. Yeah, it's just sometimes it's just too much. Well, you do reply to a lot more people than most people. And it's really sweet. I, I went through your tweets and replies recently. And it's just nice <laughs> to see you thanking people and like genuinely engaging because a lot of presenters and broadcasters must just feel completely unreachable for fans and listeners. But yeah. I kind of feel like if if I'm an average Joe and I, I tweet you saying, oh, that really touched me what you said about mental health. I'm quite likely to get a nice reply, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny actually because they um you remember people as well. So there's there are people on Twitter that I recognize because they've been interacted with me since I got Twitter. And I think I've had it for about 10 years now. I remember when I set it up, I set it up at the World Darts Championships with my friend Lisa. I was like, so what is this? <laughs> she was like, just tweet stuff. And someone tweeted me the other day, actually, with my first tweet really randomly. They went, I went back through your, your tweets, which I was like, oh, <laughs> why have you done that? And it was like, this was your first tweet. And I think it was Matt Jarvis or some, it was, it was an NFL player fancy football that got me one point that week and I was like cheers Matt and that was my first tweet and uh, and I remember being like god how long ago was that I don't think it kind of been 10 years ago anyway it was a long time ago um but yeah I still remember people um that were there from the beginning and I like it it's a community isn't it yeah and I think people like you and I that spent so much of our time and still do focus on social media and creating jobs out of it and um infiltrating that community of YouTubers and mm. figuring out what makes them tick and engaging in it. Uh, it sort of sticks with me, all of that, but it's a place that I like, which is why when it can be spiky, it kind of hurts a little bit because it's kind of like, well, that's that's always been a realm that I'm comfortable in and I really enjoy. Mm. So when you, when you are in sort of deep water that you can't, you feel like, oh, I don't know how to deal with this and you have to separate yourself. It's a, it's a strange feeling, it's a bit of like an alien feeling really. Yeah, I wanted to mention that really, the kind of trolls, obviously social media has its positives, but a lot of it is negatives, kind of people hiding behind avatars and mm. uh, tweeting some really nasty things. Mm. Do these tweets get to you or are you able to build up a, a wall, I suppose? I always think it depends what sort of mood I'm in. So if I'm tired, then um, then they can get to me. You know, when you're really like, oh, when you're sleepy or when you've worked hard or you've been traveling a lot, or also like when you know that you've not been at the top of your game, which happens a lot because, you know, like when I think about how much a broadcast, a broadcast four hours a day from 6 a.m. three times a week, then I'll do a podcast, then I'll do a Premier League interview, then I will do a game on Sunday and then I might do some odd jobs around. So sometimes I feel like I'm broadcasting more than I'm not broadcasting. Mm. And inevitably when you're on air doing anything at that for that amount of time you'll make a mistake and the problem with social media is that you cannot ever get away from that mistake and you are human you know just in the way that everybody makes a mistake you know you could be walking down the street and trip over mm. if you do the equivalent of that in your job uh, if you mispronounce a name or your words don't come out properly or you just make a mistake and you just we forget something Mm. it becomes like oh my god like what's she <laughs> yeah. doing get her out like she yeah. shouldn't be in football anyway and it's like you know they, those kind of things they do get to you you do build up a kind of a, a thicker skin about it you do there's no doubt um like at the beginning you know when we used to work on on soccer am i'd be like i wonder what people are saying about me i wonder if it's good mm. is it good and you, you'd you like put your name in twitter and search I have not done that since yeah. I think that year. I would mm. I would never search my name. I, I don't want to see what people are saying about me because I actually, um, I trust in the people that give me the jobs. And inevitably I've kind of thought about it in a way that most people use social media to, to vent and say negative things. They don't usually go out the way to say positive things. So you, you mm. can't live your life looking for compliments on Twitter because it's not a barometer of, of society. It's really not, it's not representative of society it's representative of um, a world where people are looking to, to vent. So you have to kind of, as much as you can, remove yourself from it. Well, I wanted to move on and kind of link to that and talk about mental health, because it's something that both you and I are very passionate about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to just thank you for the work you were doing on it, because you speak so beautifully on it when you do speak on it. I, I was going to basically bring up the topic of the question, how are you? Because it's mm -hmm. a question which everyone asks everyone every single day. And I kind of feel like it's kind of just been watered down to the point where you don't even get a, a response from anymore you just get okay i'm fine genuinely how, how are you how is how's lockdown and how are you coping 
isn't it weird like that question just kind of like when you actually mean it when you actually yeah. say to someone yeah, yeah but how are you but everyone's like then I actually mm. how am I I think I've been I've been very up and very down in closer sort of proximity to to any time ever I think that is what everyone feels at the moment um I kind of go day to day with it I I, I don't really I think I'm floating, if that makes sense. I think mm. I'm just sort of floating from one thing to the next, waiting for some sort of normality to happen. I, I like personally in my life, it feels weird, isn't it? When you when you want to talk about yourself because you feel like you should be talking about somebody else and saying, you, you feel like you have to justify how you feel by saying, mm. we're all in this, we're all feeling mm. a bit shit at the moment, blah, 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 blah. Mm. Um, I think when I look back at this stage in my life in particular, like I'm in an Airbnb at the moment, this is an Airbnb and the reason I'm here is because my flat sale fell through. So I was buying a flat, started at the beginning of lockdown, put the offer in, it was accepted. Seven months later, um, we were just about to exchange and it fell through. Uh, that's life, unfortunately. Mm. So um, I'd already handed in my notice where I was living and I was literally homeless. So I moved back to my mum's for a couple of weeks. I got the new dog at the same time. So I was literally just like, oh my God, mm. juggling work as well. Um, and then I needed to come back to where I, I was living so I could look at other places to buy. So, yeah, it's, it's really bizarre that I've, I've never been so upended in my life. And for somebody that constantly works to, to be where they want to be, when all of that gets sort of the rug gets whipped from, from beneath you, it's a really strange feeling. Um, but also I'm smiling because I've kind of got used to it. And uh, I like a little bit of bizarre. Do you know what I mean? And, and the person whose Airbnb I'm staying in is amazing. And she's become a really good friend. And we've only mm. been living together for a couple of weeks. Mm. And I look at all these things as these sort of bumps in the road. They're all lessons. Mm. So um, I'm trying to remember it all. And I'm trying to like write it down. And it's making me, it's making me, I think, more resilient. It's making me, um, it's just another experience, isn't it, that we deal with. So yeah, I think all in all, I think I'm okay now. I think there were times at lockdown where... Um, I have never felt as isolated as that mm. in my life. And I did struggle with that. I think if you had to do lockdown on your own, you didn't have a housemate, which I didn't, you didn't have a garden. There were, there were times where it can get quite dark. And I think also, cause I took that new job on the breakfast show during lockdown, it came with a big wave of negativity because it was like, you're replacing Alan Brazil. Um, and he's going to semi-retirement. That's not my decision. He's actually really happy with that. That's, you know, something that's going on. If somebody offers you a breakfast show, you are never going to say no. And I was never going to say no. But I had to deal with this kind of negativity. So it wasn't just lockdown for me. It was almost like, it was like lockdown with this noise here. Abusive, sexist, nasty nonsense. That that was another layer to, to what the whole world was feeling. So I did struggle with it, to be honest. I struggled quite a lot. Um, I found ways, found ways of dealing with it. You know, I spoke to my friends, my mum. I got basically, I wouldn't call her a counsellor. I'd say she's maybe like a coach. Mm. Um, and we'd have like regular Zoom calls once every week. And she would give me like coping mechanisms and suggestions and books to read and um, ways to kind of realise that what I felt like I was going through wasn't the end of the world. And think of all the things that do make you happy and it, mm. and it really dragged me through to be honest um so that was that was probably you know I've, I've experienced mental health problems in my family before that I have felt have, have been huge um it was the first time that I ever felt myself cracking and I and I couldn't get myself out of it it's the first time I ever experienced that so I found that really hard but it's mm. taught me that make yourself a support system you know you can do that you can actually talk to people and 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 ask them for help and more often than not, they probably need help too. Mm. That's the thing. And if they don't need help, they're really chuffed that you've asked them for it. Mm. But I guess it's not that easy for everybody. So it was a it was a big lesson, I think. That was really interesting. And I really want to move on to the travel um, element uh, now because that's, um, I suppose, the reason why some people will be listening. Um, <laughs> they're like, I got it. <laughs> what time <laughs> did we say we're getting into the travel? 45 minutes in, in we just started talking about travel. Right, we'll do it quick. <laughs> <laughs> so how important is travel to you? Oh, it's like amazing. It's, it's so important to me. I'll try and sub this down. But when I was little, 
we probably lived in about 10 houses in the space of like three years. You know, we moved around a lot by necessity. You know, we were in and out of council flats, state housing, all the, all these different things. It was quite turbulent when I was little. So being independent was like, my mum used to say to me that when I was really small, I used to run away all the time, not like deliberately like pack my bags and run away like when I was two years old, but I would just go for a wander and I'd end up down the street. She'd, she'd be like pulling her hair out, not knowing where I was. So I've always had for some reason this thing about moving and just getting on, getting away, exploring, doing something. And when I eventually was like old enough to go away, the first thing I did in um, like this one period of summer holidays at university was book a, a, a one-way ticket because I didn't know what day I was coming back, one-way ticket to Australia on my own. So really like travel for some reason um, and that like exploration is is like ingrained in me as something that I've always really enjoyed. Yeah. Did you, you mentioned the fact that you went traveling, was it for six months before you started working with Sky? It was, so basically I went traveling twice. So I went traveling for three months. That was in summer holidays between my second and third year of uni. And then I went and did a, like a proper round the world trip for six months. And that was, yeah, just before I started working at Sky. Amazing. Where, where did that take you? So that took me to, the first stop was South Africa. We did the garden route, mm. flew in, went all along the South Coast. Where did we fly into? We flew, we flew out of Johannesburg, we flew into Cape Town and we got on this like hop on, hop off bus and we did it for a month. Everywhere we did, we did it for a month. So we went from South Africa to Australia, Australia to New Zealand, New Zealand down uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, then India was the last month. That sounds then, absolutely yeah. amazing. Was there a favourite place from that trip? Oh, honestly, like for so many different reasons, they were all amazing. New Zealand was like everything rolled into one. Like New Zealand, you'd be on these, we did everything by like public transport and, and like travel buses, you know, where you like book a ticket, take a specific route around one country and, and meet loads of other travellers. It was amazing. And I always remember being on the bus in New Zealand and we would go, we went from the South Island to the North Island. And in the South Island, it was like my favorite place, I think. You'd be on this bus, you'd be asleep and you'd wake up and it'd just be snowy mountains. Like you could see the water coming down the mountains into this like completely clear lake with like pebbles along the floor. And it was like something out of a postcard. Mm. And every time I opened my eyes, I wanted to take more photos. We went to the glaciers and we did like this um, trip where we had these boots with picks on the bottom of them. And then like axes that we were sort of like, you know, wow. climbing things and whatever. And it was literally just this giant glacier that had like frozen. And we did skydiving. We drank loads. We made mm. loads of friends. We, um, I mean, it's literally, it was like the kind of active place to go it was New Zealand. Yeah. There was this one trip that we went to where we went to this place called, um, it was the Pooh Pub. I think they called it the Pooh Party. <laughs> I don't know why they called it then. I can't remember exactly where it was. But the, the task was to go into the shop and make a fancy dress outfit just from plastic bags. Okay. And I am like, I love fancy dress. And mm. me and my friend Kirsty were like, right, there was a prize for the winner. And it was a canyon swing. So okay. like literally, you know, like a bungee jump. Mm. It was like this kind of you sit in this swing and you you are flung from one side of the can canyon. Swung wow. to the other. And I was like, Kirsty, we're going to win this. Like, <laughs> we're going to don't worry, we're going to win this. So we went into this like DIY shop and everyone, it was like um, supermarket sweep. Everyone was like, find mm. the bin bags, whatever. So I was like, no, no, no. I know what I'm going to do. And I don't, I don't know where this came from, right? But I went and got white bin bags, some wire and some duct tape and a black marker pen. And we became astronauts. I'll send you a picture of it. Yeah, sounds good. So wire around here, astronaut helmet, then just like wrapped ourselves up with like the white of the thingy. <laughs> Silver around here and around the rim. Um, NASA written everywhere. It was like wow. it was, weird and we won it. I was going to say, no and way, you're not winning with that. We won it. Somebody, somebody dressed up as a vagina. That was particularly good. He came second. He was just a giant <laughs> vagina. It was amazing. Um, there were some, there were some really bloody good ones. There were some like quite average ones as well. A couple of cats, that sort of stuff. Um, we walked in as these astronauts, and they were like, right, you've won it. So we got our canyon swing. And I always remember that evening. They were like, right, the one thing that you have to do tonight. We're all like on this cider, like da da da. The one thing you have to do tonight is go and have a look at the, the glow worms. We were like, what? So you go down this little dark alleyway, completely pitch black, 
And if you think like in New Zealand, there's no light pollution, mm. it's just black. So when it gets dark, it's dark. And these stars are like nothing you've ever seen. So as a group, we were all like walking down this like dark alleyway. And then you basically just crouch a little bit to get below a level. And the bottoms of the, the pathway just were illuminating with like green and they were these little glow worms. And then, um, and we were trying to take photos, but you can't capture it really. It was just one of those moments where you look at it and you're like, oh my God. And we had so many of those moments when we were traveling, you know, like in South Africa, the, the stuff that we saw, like we'd go to this place called Coffee Bay where it was right on the cliff and it was run by a, like a completely indigenous group who they, they were, they would make these huts out of like the mud and then they paint them bright colors because it would stop the sun from heating them up. So they were like these really brightly colored little huts that they were living in. And they they would make this amazing bread that was like sourdough almost um, and do like dancing displays for you and stuff like that. And you'd learn all about who they were and what they were doing. And, you know, when I, we went to India as well, some of the experiences there were just incredible. When I think about all these, all the different places that we went, there were so many of these magical moments. And I actually have a diary, kept mm. a diary and I haven't read it. so. I, the plan was to read it after 10 years with my friend Kirsty, and it's been mm. 10 years, but we still haven't read them. And I kept almost a daily diary. Wow. So I know that when I go back to it, there'll be moments that I forgot about. That That's I would so nice. Like, oh my God. Is that a way of traveling which you'd recommend then? Yeah. We had a budget of a thousand pounds per country. Some we went over, some we went under, and I borrowed some money as well from my parents <laughs> and my grandparents. Um, but yeah, it was like, it was we had to do everything on a budget because we couldn't afford to but we we were like we refused to do it any other way like when we did india when you get off the plane you are offered the chance to travel india in a taxi so where you have a driver and he will take you anywhere you want to go it's so cheap out there mm. so you do that remember, remember the whole thing for that trip for that car sorry alone was 300 pounds which at the time we were like that's really expensive mm. but it was obviously we decided to do it on public transport so for the whole month travel food accommodation everything was 300 pounds that's how we decided to do mm. it but it was like it was hard it was yeah. really hot we were going through rajasthan at peak heat so there were no other um travelers because it was like the, the low season for traveling which we hadn't realized they want to sell you things because you're western and they they think you've got a lot of money mm. um so we were getting plagued quite a lot you know we were sort of like people were really having a go at us and yeah, I did, I did, I found that quite hard. And that was the last part of the journey as well. So we were quite tired. Mm. Um, but at the same time, there were things in India that I have never seen before. And I will never see again that I just thought were just like, it blew my mind. There's a place beginning with V and I can't remember it now. But, but, uh, basically it's on the Ganges, the river. Mm. It's a, a burial town. Um, people will come to this town with their loved ones that have passed away they will wrap them up, they will lift them above their shoulders and they will take them through the streets and they're tiny little alleyways, the whole town, tiny little alleyways with like fire sticks everywhere, it's incredible. And they will take them down to the Ganges and they will put their body in the river. It's it's quite, it's quite hard yeah. to see it, but if their body washes up on the side of the river with the town, they push it back in and it carries on going down the river. If it washes up on the other side, that's the holy side, you can't touch it. So, so we were doing these trips on the river they, they take you on a trip to the river and you were going past a, a wrapped up dead body on the left, which no one can touch because it's holy. And then on the right, you'd see kids swimming and, and washing in the river, same river. And it was, it was, you know, incredible. And, and you'd be going down these tiny little alleyways where you could fit one or two people passing a cow. They're all holy out there. Mm. So there were cows everywhere. Um, it was just, yeah, it was, it was mad. It was, we saw so much poverty in India that was very hard to take. And the, the thing I'll always remember is by the time we left, we became very desensitized to it. And I always think about that now. I remember from the first minute, my eyes were bulging when I landed. So we landed in Mumbai and we flew out of Delhi. And mm. We did that whole trip through Rajasthan around Rajasthan. And when I left Mumbai, sorry, when I left Delhi, I remember looking out of the window in the last place that we stayed and seeing a family sleeping on the floor on, on um, cardboard. And I remember looking at it, looking away and thinking nothing of it and then catching myself and going, shit, look how desensitized you've become. And I and I looked at them for ages and I remember writing a chapter in, in my diary about it. So it would be really interesting to go back and, and read that specifically, I think. Yeah, sounds like a really important thing to do, especially in those formative years of your life to see that kind of 
poverty yeah. and different cultures and just take everything in like that but I suppose you just want to help everyone but you can't yeah, you do you do and you can't and and especially with places like India you know they we were encouraged not to hand out money because it means that they will continually think that you are a source of money mm. also there were a lot of scams in India there were a lot of scams like we were we were taken in a car once because these guys we thought they were taxis but they were actually men that were trying to give us jewelry to take back to england so it would have been illegal and um, mm. we would have got caught on the other side of, of the plane and and the jewelry would have been on us um, and we were in this car thinking it was a taxi going up to some holy palace the monkey palace i remember i think it was in Ud udaipur and they just started talking to us about this jewelry and I, I was reading Shantaram at the time, which is an incredible book. And there was mention something about that in this book, Shantaram, which is about an Australian convict who escapes prison and, and basically lives in India. And uh, I was like, oh my God, hang on a minute. And Kirsty had also read the same book and we'd read other things saying, be careful of scams, this might happen. Anyway, we're in this car with these guys trying to get us to take their jewelry. We were like, fuck, this is so, we were like, can we get out? It was so dangerous. But at the time, you know, we were like, 20 21 years old like we wow. were just sort of going with the flow in the middle of this country that we didn't know so yeah there were loads of lessons it was a huge huge education for us and talking of asia um i saw that you went away this year you you must have had a crystal ball or something because you went away to bali is it was it in january yeah went away to bali end of jan obviously like i have this thing about traveling alone which i would recommend to anybody because the first time i traveled alone was to australia i made so many friends and had like the best time um, when I went the second time, even though it was amazing, equally as amazing, you are you don't have that fear factor that pushes you out of your, your comfort zone. You have to come out of your shell when you're on your own. So um, I remember work got super stressful and I was done over. I was just like, oh, I just needed a break from everybody, everything. Even my personal life, I just needed like a separation from everything. And um, I had always wanted to go to Bali. I'd never been. I found this amazing resort called Karma Group that one of my friends had told me about. And I got in contact with them. I said, I'm coming on my own. They recommended where I could stay. They really looked mm. after me. And my God, it was just like, for the first four days, I didn't speak to another soul. I didn't go on social media. Mm. Um, I had like saved up money for this holiday. And I was like, I'm just going to indulge. The, the Balinese people, I'm not joking when I say this, are so nice. They're the mm. nicest people I've ever experienced the nicest culture it was just like it was so wonderful everywhere I went whether that be like by the beach in a kind of commercial hotel or like um Ubud which is where I moved yeah. to eventually in the city um in that sort of you know township it was just like they were so amazing and like, that was like for me I remember I remember laying on the beach there are two songs that I will send you mm -hmm. one of them is by Ray Lamont Tan, I don't know how you actually say his surname, but I used to listen to him at university, so that was like 10, 12 years ago. Mm. And this is one song that came on and I was lying on the beach and I was listening to it and I was like, wow, and I shazammed it immediately. And it comes on my um, playlist all the time and it always takes me back to Bali yeah. and I'm like lying on that beach thinking about it. I've never experienced so much freedom. I was like, I don't want to talk to anyone. I'm just going to be on my own. And it was amazing. Then after four days, I was bored. <laughs> and oh, I was really? like, I was like, I want to meet people now. I'm yeah. bored. I've, I've, I haven't spent four days not speaking to anyone in my life and not bored of the surroundings. But I, again, I wanted human contact. So I was like, right. Mm. So went back to the hotel. I'd only booked to go there for a week, which is an error because Bali is such a long way away. Mm. Um, so I, I went back to my hotel room and I got ready for a night out. And I was like, I'd been thinking about it all day and getting myself like really hyped up and excited. And I, and I, I was like, right, you know what? let's go and explore. And I put the first post out on social media to say I was in Bali. And I had all these messages from people going, oh my God, you've got to try this place, this place. And I was like, mm. I haven't left my hotel for four days. I have not got enough time for this. What, what am I doing? I need to explore. So anyway, got home, had a shower, put a nice dress on, walked out of the hotel, walked along the beach, took my camera. I had like, do you remember that camera that I bought that you recommended? Yeah, the uh, Canon 60D. 60D, that was it. Yeah. I'd never used it since I bought it. <laughs> do you remember I had all these plans? I was like, we're yeah. doing YouTube videos myself. I never used it for anything. So I took it to Bali and it's the first time really that I'd learned to use it for proper photos, not for mm. filming. Walked along this beach to the, to the next hotel where it was like this, this really cool 
um, beach bar. I sat down, ordered food on my own, got a cocktail, was taking photos. There were fire shows, all sorts. Anyway, um, this girl came up to me and um, she was a German girl, Teresa. And she went, hi, sorry to interrupt. Just wondered what you ordered because it looks amazing. And I was like, oh, it's this, this and that. And she went, are you on your own? And I was like, yeah, I am. And she went, oh, me and, and this girl, Addie, she's also a single traveler. We've just made friends. Do you want to join us? Oh, that's nice. So anyway, long story short, I joined them. I extended my flight for another five days. I went to Ubud. I stayed in a wicker, like literally just like a wicker hut. We we traveled around Ubud. We went to all these temples. We went into the sea. We, we did like, we learned how to make coffee. We did all these amazing things with these people I'd only just met and I ended up flying home. And I was just like, it was probably apart from that traveling in, you know, it was like the most amazing magical trip. It, it was just, it, kind, it, it was proof to me that I was like, I can still go somewhere on my own and back mm. myself to, to go out, make friends, have a great time and, and, you know, exploit that time that I have. Oh, sounds amazing. And difficult to top, but I want to ask what the best holiday you've ever been on is. That one was like bloody great. I mean, obviously there's been a few Ibiza trips, which I don't remember much of. <laughs> uh, do you know what? I remember the first time I went to Vegas. Mm. It wasn't, it wasn't a holiday. It was for work, but it felt like a holiday and we were covering the Moscone Cup and I was a runner and it was the first, my boss, I remember, I always remember my boss saying to me, this is separate because obviously I've mentioned all the traveling, traveling is mm. incredible and, and obviously that's holiday, but this is something I haven't spoken about. My boss, Rory was like, Laura, and I said, yeah, and he went, what happens in Vegas? And I went, stays in Vegas? And he went, correct answer, you're going. And I went, what? I was like, I'm going to, what for? And he was at Moscone Cup. I went, what, what's the Moscone Cup? Amazing. <laughs> like nine ball pool, I was like, what? Anyway, it was it was just incredible. Like we we worked hard, but we played hard, and mm. we just had like I think I was twenty two at the time, and I couldn't believe I was in Vegas for work. I couldn't believe I was being paid to be there. And it was like I remember landing, looking out the window, someone nudging me and going, "Look!" And I saw the strip. Mm. I could see the strip as we were landing. It was pitch black, and um, and we were like circling the strip, and then we landed. Honestly, like. I've never seen so many lights in one place. Mm. Everything was massive. We were going to all these different parties. We were like going out for dinner in these sky straight scrapers. And I don't gamble, not because I'm like particularly bad at it. I just don't really, it doesn't give me a buzz. I don't mm. really enjoy it. I'm not really a gambler, but I was going into casinos and like, you know, gambling with like $1 and stuff like that. And just before I left, my brother said to me, he said, put 50 on black before you go. And I went, or 100, put 100 on black before you go. And I went, okay, cool. Um, and he went, and if you win, then we split it. And if you lose, then I'll pay you back. And I was like, all right, cool. So put 50 on black and I won. Oh, and, that, and it was the last thing I did before I left Vegas. And I always remember it. And that was like the only time really I've ever really gambled. But yeah, it was, it was like a coming of age going out there. Oh, that sounds absolutely amazing. And um, is there a favorite city you've been to? favorite city new york yeah amazing new york i've been three times the first time i ever went I, that was actually for work actually the first time i ever went again and i stayed there for three weeks doing the us open tennis oh, and we stayed a little bit longer after so basically a, gig. Was there for a month and my god it was a gig boiling hot incredible i stayed on just because i loved new york I, I i don't know whether it's because i watch american tv when i was younger like friends mm. but when I landed in New York, I felt so familiar with it. It felt nostalgic. It was really strange. And I was walking down the streets and I was like, yeah, I feel like I've been here before. And then every time I went back for holidays, I just felt like if there was anywhere else in the world I was ever going to live, apart from Australia, which now has been replaced, it, it was mm. New York. It was so busy. I remember landing there and, and thinking that when you go through customs, they're really horrible to you. Like, you know, mm. security and customs are horrible. And I remember thinking, fuck New York. I hate yeah. it. And then once you get in and you're like, oh my God, this is the most amazing. It's just the most amazing city in the world and everything. And like, you know, we did all the tourist attractions and, uh, you know, it was just, I loved it. I, I would go back in a heartbeat. I think it's, yeah, by far my favorite city. Yeah, I went to New York as well with my girlfriend and we were there for three nights and it just, I've got so many memories from that trip. It felt like, it kind of felt like we were there for about a week. Just I such know. an amazing place. Yeah, because you have to get it all in, don't you? Yeah. You're like, oh, we have to do this, we have to do Rockefeller, we yeah. have to go and see, what's her face? 
Who, who is she? Uh, it's Statue of Liberty. And I was getting recommendations from Seb, like a colleague of ours, like, oh, you have to go to this pizza place and stuff like that. Oh my, yeah, there's, there's just, there's not enough time to do everything yeah. that you want to do there. I took my best mate there for her birthday. There were four of us girls and we had, um, we, we went, we rented out these like suites in this hotel room. And um, I remember I left my phone in the cab the, the, on the way to the hotel from the airport. So for the first night I was phoneless, but my God, it was like, I'm free. I was like, yeah. I, have no, I can't do anything. I can't speak to anyone. I'm just with the girls. And it was just like, it was amazing. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. It's definitely, yeah. New York is, is, is by far my favorite. If I had to push you and ask you city breaks or beach holidays, and you can only do one for the rest of your life, what would you say? <laughs> you stuck that one in there, didn't you? Shit. <laughs> for the rest of my life. Shit. Do you know what? I'm actually going to say city because I love the beach, obviously. And that's mean of you to make me take that out <laughs> of my life. But I'm definitely a city girl. And also in a city, you can have a river. Yeah, so you cheat, cheat in the system a little bit. I did, didn't I? <laughs> but I do. <laughs> I think like the River Thames, for example, there is something mm. about like, I live on the River Thames, mm. not like a goblin, you know, I'm not, like, <laughs> not like under the bridge or something like that, like an ogre. But I live, I live basically next to the River Thames. I went to uni in Kingston, which was on the River Thames. And I don't know where it's come from, but I've always had a bit of an affinity with it. I don't know. When I was little, I used to live in um, Liverpool Street Station. Mm. Um, my dad was a policeman at that station and we lived in the flats above it. So for about three years, and I was, it might not even have been three years, but when I was like two, I remember growing up in the city of London. That was my home. And I remember everything. That, that might be why I like New York so much because everything when I was little was huge, mm. all the buildings. And sometimes like I'll find myself walking through Liverpool Street Station now, and I'm around there a lot now, I work around there. And I still get this little like, oh, I, I get this little feeling like I'm a little, kid again mm -hmm. and I remember it so much so I think being around the river and being around the city um feels very homely to me um so yeah I think city breaks nice and New York's an amazing place for food but is there anywhere better can you pick out one place you've been where the food is just amazing the food was amazing in Bali I have to say you know what for a kind of different reason when I was in India I didn't eat curry I've now, I, I didn't like curry at the time. I've now discovered I do like curry. <laughs> I was just really fussy. So I spent a month in India not knowing I really like curry. Oh, <laughs> Can you no. believe that? Can you believe that? <laughs> all these different Mumbai, Delhi, all the different places through Rajasthan. And I didn't know that I like curry. What were you <laughs> I eating? Like, I was eating tomato soup <sighs> and naan bread. <laughs> I'm not even joking. And also, which is what I'm about to tell you, Mango. I have an obsession with mangoes, right? I first, I, I started eating mango when I was in Thailand because they cut it up for you and give it to you in a little bag on the beach. They were, they were so cheap. And I swear to God, I was eating like four mangoes a day plus. <laughs> I was having for breakfast, lunch, dinner. I was orange, you know, like I looked orange. I looked like a mango. So I was like going out for dinner, having like tomato soup and naan bread with Kirsty, my, my um, mate who we traveled with. And when we, were when we were like on the coaches, you'd have to stop at places, um, at basically refreshment breaks and, and bus stops. And they had this thing, I think it was pakora. You could have vegetable pakora. So cauliflower, lemon, um, bits of chutney, like bits of sort of different bits of, of vegetables in it. And it was, you stick it, they, it's like a little ball, dump it in the fryer and then they sell it to you. And again, it was like 50 bar. So every time we stopped, I'd get some of this mm. pakora and my God, it was amazing. And sometimes you wouldn't know what you're buying. So accidentally mm. you'd buy like chili pakora, which blew your head off. <laughs> but I remember when we were traveling, we did a lot of money, it was bloody hot, a bag of pakora and either whole mango or mango juice. And because it was boiling, the mango juice was just like, oh, it was, it yeah. was like, like liquid gold. So even though it's not like standard kind of gourmet or anything like that, I just remember that being, yeah, I really liked it. Amazing. Does food dictate where you choose to go at all? No, I'm not really a foodie. I love food. I'm obsessed with eating, but I'm not really a foodie. So I'll never go, oh, we have to go to that restaurant because apparently mm. it does great food. I'll go if it does great cocktails mm. or um, I'll go because it's got a great view or, you know, it's like, a, I don't know, good for another reason. But 
food is never really my priority i'm not like a kind of i know you're quite a foodie aren't you yeah i like my food i make sure i'm very much uh like my my girlfriend gets dragged to these restaurants just because i've heard about them online it's like we went to miami last year and it was very much like we have to go to this place this yeah. mexican restaurant it's like the best mexican restaurant in miami and it's on the beach so I kind of think she likes it really. Problem is, right, you have to you have to be a foodie to appreciate it sometimes because what what will happen is someone says to me, go to this place because it does the best steak in the world. I'll have ketchup with it. And I'll be <laughs> like, well, what's the point? And then I'm like, but I like steak and ketchup. They're like, well, there's no point coming here then. You might just go somewhere else. So mm. that's like, because I grew up with quite a fussy eater, I do quite like quite standard stuff, quite standard food. So I think that's probably why I've never really... You know, I'm not one of those people. <laughs> yeah, there's something nice to be said about just walking around the city and going, okay, I'm going to go there to eat rather than, yeah, for example, I'll be like, we have to go here and it's like 20 minute cab outside the centre. <laughs> We've got to work out how we're going to get there and back. Yeah, exactly. They did this thing in Thailand as well, where it's like, there were just big walks with noodles and stuff on the mm. side. So you'd walk past and you'd be, I, I always remember it was like in Thailand, a bag of um, mango, cut up mango and then um, spring rolls. They do like a little bag of three spring rolls and some um, sour sauce mm. and sweet and sour sauce. And it was just like heaven. And you could watch them. They'd wrap them up in front of you, stick in the fryer. And honestly, it was just it was just so nice. And they'd be on every corner, you know, Koh Sam Road. You, they'd be like one stop here, one stop 50, what, five meters later, another one five minutes later. And you could just keep just picking up bits and bobs. And it was, yeah, I loved it. I loved doing that. Amazing. Is there a place that you could always go back to? Yeah, Byron Bay in Australia. Byron Bay in Australia, when I went on my own, that was the first trip I ever did you know, traveling. Mm. Um, Byron Bay I got to and I'd run out of money. And when I say I'd run out of money, I was like completely empty. The first I, stop? It was, no, it was, it was actually, I'd basically had spent a month in Sydney. Then I flew to Cairns, which is right at the top. I had a job as a bus driver because I'd run out of money by then and I couldn't keep asking my mum and my dad. I was like, yeah. I had to grow up, you know. I'd run out of savings. I'd run out of asking them for favours. I called up this place and I was like, listen, um, I'm a traveller, but I need a job. But I don't have a working visa. He was like, can you drive? And I was like, yeah, I can. And he went, can you get here tomorrow? And I was like, yeah, I can. Anyway, I flew. I'd never met this guy before. It was a hostel. When I got there, Rosie's Hostel, it was called. My job was to drive the bus to pick people up from the airport, from like the Greyhound and Oz Experience bus stops, bring them back to the hotel, to the hostel, tell them why they should come and stay with us, a bit like a holiday rep. Yeah. But, and I found out when I got there, the reason he gave me the job is because the bus driver that had just left was called Laura. So he was like, oh, it's easier. Your name's Laura. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, cool. So I did that for a month, earned money, got commission on bringing people in and then went down the coast. So went, mm. went down the East coast, traveled back down that way stopped at different places i stopped at byron bay i had no money it's like a hippie town basically mm. it's, on the, it's on the beach it is so laid back amazing you know people just go there and disappear not like in a weird way not like <laughs> people go there and they and they just can become anonymous and you know hide from the world and then um, i was in this hostel and um there was this guy of course there's always a guy isn't there there was this guy <laughs> he was french he had long blonde dreadlocks uh his name was julian he just wore like these massive kind of baggy trousers like vest tops and and he was like the most beautiful thing i'd ever seen andy quinn who works on, yeah. on football he's the one that gave me the email address to get into sky okay so, so he wasn't working at sky at the time i met him in australia that's how i met andy wow so on just traveling i met him on fraser island and we became really good friends. And then we bumped into each other again at Byron Bay. And he remembers the hippie. And he was going out with this like amazing surfer chick girl. She mm. was like super hot. And I, I was like, how did you get her? <laughs> anyway, so we'd all like, we'd met each other in different places. And then you bump into the same people when you're traveling and you're doing the same route. And we kept bumping into people that we'd just met along the coast and stuff like that. Andy was one of them. Anyway, it was genuinely, I had no money to the point where like I had to wait three days for my student loan to come in. And I refused to ask anybody for money. So I didn't eat for two and a half days. Wow. And I was so hungry. I've never experienced that hunger in my life. I started getting like delusional almost. It was like mad. And then I remember the boys, we, they were like, come out for a drink. And I was like, 
I can't mm. have a drink. And, and, and I think Andy was like, I'll buy you a drink. And I was like, oh, I, don't, I didn't want anyone to, like, you know, give me anything. Anyway, they were like, come, come, come. So I remember going out for a drink. I didn't smoke, but somebody had a cigarette and I was just like, I just needed something. Yeah. <laughs> Took a puff of the cigarette and I felt like I was going to faint. And then someone yeah. gave me a cider. Andy, I think it was, gave me a cider. Obviously went straight to my head. I was like buzzing. I had, it was the first thing I'd had in like days. And then when my student lane came in, um, I went to the shop, bought loads of food and my tummy had shrunk so much. I, could, I actually had a bowl of cereal and couldn't eat anything else. But anyway, that's by the by. This experience in Byron Bay was just, was like incredible. My student loan came in, which meant I could stay in Byron Bay a little bit longer. And it was like, it's like a really spiritual place. You know, you do like yoga there. You go for like walks on the beach. They're, they're kind of, they're into everything in that kind of like hippie lifestyle. And it was just, I, yeah, I just remember it being like a really special place. I That's what's special to me. It's not like, I don't go somewhere for like foodie. I go somewhere for like the experience, if that makes yeah. sense. And that was, that was somewhere that I always feel like you leave a little bit of your heart in, in places. And I definitely like, I left like a big bit of my heart there. Do you tend to go back to places more than once or are you big on trying to take in new experiences? Do you know what? I went back to Byron Bay um, and I know I've just said I will go back there again. But what I just remembered was I went back there when I went traveling again. So the second time with the girls and I took them to Byron Bay because I was like, we have to go and see this place. It was the Arts Factory. So if anyone's been traveling, the Arts Factory in Byron Bay is, is where the whole love story setting was. And it wasn't just a love story. It was the friends I made there. And like, mm. it was just this incredible experience. Um, I went back to um, Byron Bay with the girls and um, it just wasn't the same. Mm. And they weren't as excited as I was. Julian wasn't there. Andy wasn't <laughs> there. All the other friends weren't there. It just felt like a different place. But the, the, you know, the place itself was still incredible and still magical and we made different memories. But it was like, if you're going back to feel that same feeling, you mm. won't get it again. Mm. You just, you won't. There are other places in Australia where I remember like, I went for a jog. I can't remember where it was. I went for a jog. And as I started jogging down this random road, it started like pissing it down mm. to the point where it was like a monsoon and it happened like that. And I carried on jogging and a dog turned up and started jogging with me. And I was like, what the fuck's this dog? <laughs> but it was jogging with, so I was like, okay, let's go together. So I was like running in the rain with this dog. And then I turned back to run back and the dog carried on running with me. And then I lost it. And I stopped to, to like, I was like, where, where's this dog gone? And the place that I'd stopped, I looked at, and there was basically like a, a plaque on a stick and it would where someone had passed away. And I was convinced, I was like, it's the ghost of that person in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, there's these weird, there's these, and I wrote a chapter about it. Yeah. It's like these weird things that I will always connect with places that will I will always remember. Now I want to go traveling again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> yeah. Is there a particular holiday that means the most to you? I think if you can call it a holiday, because essentially traveling, I suppose, is a holiday. That first trip to Australia when I was 20... I was 19 and I turned 20 when I got out there and I spent it with people I'd never met before. I, I met a woman on the plane. who was an Australian woman, sat next to her. Um, she started chatting to me and she had a couple of sons and she gave me her email address. And I remember I was on, I was on my own in Australia and it was my birthday. And I was like, I'm not spending my 20th birthday on my own. So I emailed this woman mm. and I said, would your boys mind coming out with me for my birthday? And she was like, yeah, they've said yes. So I went to this random sports club i remember it was the um state of origin okay and that was that was playing that night and i met these two brothers and all of their friends and i'd never met them in my life but about 10 of them and i sat and watched the state of origin with them when i got absolutely hammered <laughs> and i remember they were down in pints and i was dining dining wine because they were like you're english you can down things and i was like okay <laughs> so i was down in wine they were dining pints I've never been so drunk in my life. I was sick for like two days after, so I think I gave myself alcohol po poisoning. <laughs> but it was, um, again, it was one of those moments where I was like, I refused to sit in on my own. I, I was like pushing the boundaries of, of trying to grow up. Mm. And, um, and yeah, I, I loved it. So I think that whole trip, that three months in Australia when I was on my own was, was the making of me in a way. So that, that one means, I think means the most. Love it. And is there a dream destination you've got but on a place that tops your bucket list? There's there's play, there's lots of places in America that I haven't been before that I'd love to be that I'd love to go. I've been to most places elsewhere and in Europe. 
Um, I've never been to Fiji. Mm. Bali was that one really that I was like, I'd really like to go. The one thing that I always talk about doing is going and seeing the um, the Northern Lights. Yeah. I'd love to do that. So whether that's like, it's not too far away. You can go to a few different destinations, can't you? Mm. I think that's the one that I want to do next. Go yeah. See yeah. Smith Smithy said the same thing. Right. Smith, yeah. Smith, why don't we? Why don't we vlog it? Why don't yeah, we do it for old time's sake? Why don't we take the van? <laughs> get the van back together. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Sounds good. Count me in. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, the dog's just woken up. Oh. Yeah. Well, this has been an amazing podcast. It's been amazing oh. speaking to you and catching up again. I really oh. appreciate you taking the time to talk to me as well too. Anytime, honestly, anytime. It's been long overdue, to be fair. As soon as we're all allowed back out again, we'll take Smithy on the road and we'll go get a prosy, as he likes to call it. Prosy. <laughs> yeah. What a prosy, anyone? <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. So there we go. That was episode three of the Travel Talks podcast with Laura Woods. Thanks again to Laura for coming on and to you for listening to. I really do appreciate it. If you did enjoy the podcast, then it would really mean a lot if you could go to whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on and give us a five-star review. We've also got a YouTube channel, an Instagram account, and a Twitter account. If you want to see more from the show, get some clips, information on what kind of guests we've got coming on, then you can follow us on Travel Talks Pod on Twitter and Travel Talks Podcast on Instagram. Thanks again, guys, and I'll be back next week with another amazing guest.